Here we go. President Joe Biden and prominent uh, Democrats from the House and Senate yesterday celebrated his latest legislative victory with his signing of the Respect for Marriage Act, blasting Lady Gaga at a ceremony on the White House lawn. Attended by a large crowd of supporters, included live performances by Cyndi Lauper and Sam Smith and the lighting of the White House in rainbow colors. The New York Times reporter Eric Lipton noting that whatever your views on politics were, or whether you like the policies or not, the Biden administration has accumulated an incredible list of legislative accomplishments in less than two years, like the Inflation Reduction Act, which included billions to combat climate change, bipartisan infrastructure law that accomplished what the ex-president kept promising when every week was Infrastructure Week, and the American Rescue Plan that shored up the economy and kept many Americans afloat during the pandemic. In a new Republic podcast, Elizabeth Warren explains that this is the core of why Democrats outperformed in the midterms, that good policy makes for good politics. And Senator Warren, Democrat of Massachusetts, joins me now. I've been very focused on this in thinking about the midterms and thinking about particularly this, which I think is the real telltale sign. How few Democratic incumbents lost. Not a single Democratic incumbent in the Senate, very few relative to other years in the House. Why was that? What did it have to do with the record of the bills they voted for? Because we actually got out there, fought for working families, and delivered for working families. So even though it was just two years, and even though we had the skinniest possible majority in the Senate, we nonetheless, as Democrats, pulled together just enough to be able to deliver for working families. And that gave us something to run on in the midterms. It really is the reminder, good policies are good politics because these were good policies that we were able to deliver on. As you said, climate, a $35 cap on insulin for seniors. We're gonna get a $2,000 cap on how much seniors spend altogether annually on prescription drugs. Uh, we're able to talk about what we tried to do for people, what we are doing on uh, reducing student loan debt. Just one after another after another, 15% minimum corporate tax on billionaire corporations. You know, these are the kinds of things that are not just popular among Democrats. They're popular among Democrats, Republicans, and independents. We showed that it is possible to put government on the side of the people. And what did the Republicans do by contrast? They screamed, they yelled, they said hateful things, but they had nothing. No ideas, not even promises of how they were going to help people have more opportunity and make their lives better. The Democrats had a darn good argument in the midterms. The, the cap on insulin and, and generally prescription drug prices, I saw a bunch of polling from a bunch of pollsters that said that polled, you know, at 80 percent or yeah. and then across the board. Right? This is like genuinely. I, I want to just indulge me a little bit of, of hypothetical pushing you because I think you're right, right? So I think that basically there was a kind of Venn diagram between things that were popular and that were good policies. But there's also like, there was a lot of stuff left on the cutting room floor. I, I think about this a lot in that original Inflation Reductive Act, Reduction Act proposal kept getting pared back. Now, I think the vast bulk of that would have been good policy and would have been better for the country. I also think it might have precipitated more political backlash, frankly. Like, it does seem to me there are points, and you know this as a senator, where you are trading off sometimes between what might be good policy and what might invite political backlash. You know, I'm just not there with you on this huh. one. I gotta say, if we could have gotten universal child care, I think we'd have just had that, that many more people saying, yeah. I am all the way in, I, I wanna go all the way on that. Again, because it is good policy. And that's the kind of thing we're going to be fighting for going forward. And, and again, it's all about delivering for people where they are, the things that make a difference. You know, for so long, the Republicans have run on the notion that government's bad, government's yep. terrible. At, at best, government is inept. At worst, it's, uh, it's really actually doing harm. We're out there demonstrating exactly the opposite. We are showing that government can be on your side. Look right now, for example, on inflation. What 
do people across this country understand is one of the major causes of higher prices? Price gouging. And for the first time in what feels like forever, I mean decades and decades, we actually have an FTC and a Department of Justice that are trying to enforce the antitrust laws and mm. really going after companies that are engaged in price gouging, going after this enormous concentration that has happened in industry after industry after industry. And this is one, even if people on Capitol Hill don't always get it, I guarantee the president of the United States gets it and the people across this country get it. Final question for you is on Jay Powell, the chair of the Fed. Sure. You're very, you've been critical of him, particularly uh, the, the regulatory parts of his stewardship of the Fed. Um, you were, you, I think, objected to his renomination. It was fairly controversial. Mm -hmm. I was always sort of a little ambivalent because I think he did a pretty good job on the monetary policy lever during the pandemic. Uh, he gave a speech today that was basically, to summarize, we're not stopping until we put this economy into recession. That's certainly how it sounded to me. And you have been very critical. But I got to say, what was what, do you, what was going through your head as you heard him basically announce, we're going to do whatever we can to make sure more people are out of work? Yeah, because that's exactly it. Can we just do the translation? When he says, I want to cool off the economy and we want to see a, a rise in the unemployment rate. My question back to him is just exactly how many people, how many millions of people do you want to see fired before you stop engaging in these extraordinary interest rate hikes that he has been doing? And, you know, here's the thing you have to remember. The Fed just has this one tool, raise got. interest rates. And yet there are a whole lot of things that are causing prices to go up. Uh, we know that the pandemic, we know supply chain kinks, we know that price gouging. But we also know that raising interest rates, for example, is not going to bring down the cost of housing. It sure doesn't make it easier for somebody trying to buy their first house. And it doesn't make it easier for builders to come in and yeah. build new housing, which is what we need to bring those prices down. So I, I just keep trying to remind him there is a difference between landing a plane and crashing yes. a plane. And particularly Stop after yesterday. with the big increases. The yep. picture, the yesterday's data made, made a soft landing seem mm -hmm. possible, and I hope that we can get there. Senator Elizabeth Warren, always a pleasure. Thank you. Me too.